What about the lumbrical muscle? Now, we will spend more time with a specific course just on the lumbrical, but let's look at it briefly. What would you say is the primary function of the lumbrical muscle? The lumbrical muscle doesn't usually um, get much respect or much discussion. Dr. Phelan, which was discussing a 1968 paper from Dr. Long, said the interosseous and lumbrical muscles are no longer considered to be a functional unit, but are two separate kinesiological entities. We will clarify in subsequent courses the extraordinary differences between these two muscles, origins, insertions, and functions. But suffice it to say that the lumbrical muscle is not at all the same as the interosseous muscles. And one cannot glibly say the intrinsics because they, these muscles have different functions. The lumbrical muscle has an abundant number of proprioceptive endings that allow it to be an influence for controlling tension of both the flexors and the extensors. Thus, we look to the lumbrical as being very active in controlling and coordinating the fine movements and balance. If I drew a schematic drawing of the dominance of the lumbrical muscle, it looks rather insignificant because I could draw a straight line in one lateral band and I could draw a dotted line of the contribution from that lateral band into the dorsal apparatus. But ironically, even though this influence appears relatively small, the lumbrical muscle is considered to have a major influence on the dorsal apparatus. Because of its direct line of pull to the terminal tendon insertion, I consider the lumbrical muscle to be a prime DIP joint extensor greater than the influence at the PIP joint. Although it has a longer moment arm than the interosseous at the MP joint, the lumbrical muscle is a fairly weak muscle and therefore it is a weak MP joint flexor. This correctly should be called the intrinsic plus posture because both the lumbrical and the interosseous muscles are active, but it should not correctly be called the lumbrical plus. This is not lumbrical plus because the lumbrical alone is not working, nor is it the primary MP joint flexor. So shift your terminology to intrinsic plus rather than lumbrical plus. One important point that clarifies this greatly is to simply remember that the profundus tendon from which the lumbrical arises and the lumbrical is ne they're never simultaneously active. These two muscles never contract at the same time. It's easy to figure out whether the profundus is being active and therefore that automatically tells you whether or not the lumbrical is active. So how does the lumbrical muscle work? Well in this illustration on the left and this one in the middle both of these, the profundus, is active or contracted. And in both of these circumstances, the lumbrical has to relax because it has to elongate. It has to elongate here over the IP joints. There's some tension taken away because it's volar here. But here it has to elongate even more because it may have to elongate over a hyperextended MP joint. You can see that in this posture, the profundus is moving proximal. So it's taking this origin with it. It's moving the origin proximal. At the same time, it is having to traverse a longer distance over the IP joints. So it's being elongated this direction and this direction. This is very unusual because most muscles have a stationary origin and they are elongated usually with a pull in one direction. 
But in both of these, the lumbrical muscle is being elongated proximally and distally simultaneously. It's being stretched on both ends. In these circumstances, the profundus is not active. The lumbrical is active. And so the lumbrical is contracting. And in this example, with the MP joint extended, the lumbrical contraction is shortening the muscle and therefore is pulling the entire structure proximally. As it does that, it must have a stable base and it does to some extent pull the profundus distally until it meets the resting tension. By pulling its origin distally, it actually creates some laxity in the flexor tendon in the finger and takes tension off of it. I believe the role of the lumbical is often ignored in rehabilitation of zone 2 flexor tendon injuries and that we should consider it to be a way to remove some tension on zone 2 repaired flexor tendons. With the MP joint flexed, again the pull is distally to extend the, excuse me, the pull is distally to the flexor but proximally to extend the IP joints. Therefore, in both of these circumstances, the lumbrical muscle is extending the IP joints and simultaneously pulling the profundus origin distally to create slack in the profundus tendon. In both circumstances, the profundus is relaxed and the lumbrical is contracted. The lumbrical muscle is able to be effective mechanically only when it contracts, it pulls the profundus tendon distally, it meets the resting tension of the profundus muscle, and it will not go any further distally. At that point, it has a stable origin, and now the continued contraction provides tension to extend the IP joints. Obviously this all happens within a split of a second. The same thing happens in this posture. It pulls the tendon of the profundus distally. It's stabilized and now it's able to pull proximally for IP joint extension. If we look at this specimen we see the profundus tendon and we see the extraordinary length of the lumbrical muscle. Think about it. The lumbrical muscle excursion, the small intrinsic lumbrical muscle, must be almost equivalent to the extrinsic flexors, which has significant excursion, because it must move along with it and not impede the profundus when it's active. So how would we describe normal lumbrical muscle function. When the lumbrical is contracted, it is pulling its origin distally until it meets resistance and then it is able to extend the IP joints. When it is relaxed, the origin is moving proximally because the profundus is active and this distal aspect is moving distally because interphalangeal joint flexion demands distal excursion. Another way to think about this is the muscle contraction creates motion in both directions toward the center of the muscle. It pulls the profundus distally and it pulls the distal aspect proximally. When it's relaxed, the lumbrical is stretched in both directions. Proximal excursion of the profundus stretches the lumbrical proximally and finger flexion stretches it distally. A really magical biomechanical example.
the coolest thing, in my opinion, is the fact that the lumbrical muscle diminishes the tension of its own origin. What that means is as the lumbrical muscle pulls the profundus distally, creating slack, the slack that it creates has taken any tension away because it's making its own job easier of extending the IP joints. In other words, the lumbrical removes the tension of the counterbalancing muscle in order to make its own job easier. I think that's just extraordinary. So I would say that the lumbrical muscle is a primary IP joint extensor because of this pull being transferred into IP joint extension. It does have a moment arm for MP joint flexion, but that is secondary. We will look at that in more detail uh, in the course on the lumbrical. Long did a classic study that was then quoted by others where he stimulated the lumbrical muscle and found that with strong electrical stimulation to the lumbrical there was interphalangeal joint extension followed by MP joint flexion. But if the level of stimulation was low there was only interphalangeal joint extension. A wonderful demonstration of the fact that the lumbrical is a weak MP joint flexor and thus secondary. The lumbrical is a primary IP joint extensor and it is active regardless of the position of the MP joint. Remember we said that the interosseous tends to be a bit more variable based on the MP joint position. And bovine said that it is the most consistent perform performer. The lumbrical muscle is there. Others have actually called it the workhorse of the dorsal apparatus. Not because of its power, but because it's always there and it's always working and it's always contributing. So this small muscle, inserting only on one side of the dorsal apparatus, is indeed a very significant contributor to interphalangeal joint motion. It's actually more efficient than the interossei for interphalangeal joint extension. Obviously this does not come from me but from many others. The lumbrical has a radial insertion but everyone agrees that there is no radial deviation moment arm. It does not radially deviate the finger. It only has a moment arm in the flexion and extension plane. So with interphalangeal joint extension, the lumbrical is diminishing the tension of the flexor digitorum profundus. Through the lateral band, it is extending the DIP joint rather directly. And it is tensioning the radial lateral band and thus contributing to the entire dorsal apparatus and secondarily to PIP joint extension. During finger flexion, the lumbrical is not active, but as we've previously discussed, it must elongate. It elongates proximally because of the movement of the profundus from which it originates, and it is elongated distally because of interphalangeal joint flexion demanding a greater length. In the active hook posture, the lumbrical is also not active, and it is elongating in the absolutely identical way. There actually is a bit more elongation because if there's MP joint extension, there's a greater distance for the lumbrical to travel because it's volar to the axis of the joint. In the hook posture where the MP joint hyperextends, this is the maximum elongation, but remember, the single most important point for maximum lumbrical elongation is this must be active, it cannot be passive, because there must be proximal movement of the profundus. There must be proximal movement of the profundus and that can only occur actively. The lumbrical will be discussed in much greater detail in another course.